I think we just just uh, start. Good morning, everybody. How are you? How you doing? Happy uh, hump day. Uh, Philip Bittner will be joining us in a little bit. He's in transit across Ukraine, um, which is no small feat in and of itself. And it's a great thing to even know that he's cool and that he's he's fine, all's well, and he's just traveling. Uh, it is indeed hump day through a rather humpy week, I will say. And thanks to everybody who joined last night for, I think, one of the biggest chat gatherings in the show's history that wasn't an election or something enormous, which I think also speaks to the enormity of the the response to the Jan 6 committee and the new uh, 
information that they put out yesterday with Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. Fascinating stuff, to say the very least. My feeling that it would that it's tee up um, for either Meadows or um, or you know Trump's lawyer. Those one of those two. Um, I think was born out over the last 24 hours. And we, we'll we'll see that they essentially needed to get this stuff out and about into the public sphere of information and reviewed um, before they brought up that other stuff. The There's also a, a fascinating part of the story is that the Republicans and the, and the right have, for some reason, and this is like easy bait to get people to take. It's very curious. But they jumped on this whole idea that she said because she was relating a story from these two Secret Service agents that were, uh, you know, quite frankly, known as Trump sycophants, that they, uh, when they relayed the story to her, one of them, the the main one who told the story while Bobby Engels sat there and listened or uh, quivered because of what had happened, um, they, they prefaced the story by saying, did you hear what happened uh, in the beast, meaning the the president's uh, transport, not the actual limo, because he wasn't in it. He was in a SUV where he, you know, the same one, by the way, he took a trip around Walter Reed in, same exact vehicle. And anybody who's ever sat in a Suburban knows that all you have to do is lean forward and you can touch the driver. It's just silly. So the idea that, you know, there's a glass wall and he was separated in the limousine and here's Melania and they're, they're doing this like cutaway shot, which is frigging hilarious. I'll show you. Hold on one second. Um, and by the way, good morning. You're watching House Parks Mornings Mega Worldwide. This is a, you know, a little, this show's a little more loosey-goosey than the afternoon show. Debunked is now uh, trending in the wonderful world of uh, let's see, move this guy. I don't know. I don't need this extra. Okay. Um, there we go. Let's go to this guy right here. Yeah. So deep, if you look at trending, it's the number one right now. Uh, number one thing trending right now is debunked. And the reason is, is all of these dudes putting out, where is it? Because it's going so fast. Uh, these dudes, there it is. So this graphic is making its way around um, the the Q spheres out there. This is posted at media.patriots.win. <laughs> um, the Meadows aide claiming Trump tried to grab the steering wheel. The president's limo is lying. It would literally be impossible for him to do so because the partition separates the driver from the passengers. Um, imagine going to all this work. First of all, drawing this like comfortable shot of Trump and Melania in there. Um, I, I mean, I guess this is the this is a breakdown of it or whatever. But the idea is that there's this separate panel here uh, that he separated, you know, from the Secret Service by a wall of Diet Cokes and and automatic weapons. Uh, the problem that they have is this car was not the car he was in. He was just in a standard SUV. I mean, a an up-armored special one, no question, but he could absolutely, you know, he could, ab- he could reach forward and change the station on the radio if he wanted to in the SUV, period, end of story. I mean, f- physical limitations due to his fish delight habit notwithstanding. He, a, a, a normal physically active person could do this. So this is this is the story that they've been they I mean they went all in on this in the last 24 hours saying that this is this is how they debunk the story. Look at this. Devil's advocate the infographic says with a glass partition only a Trump has a switch to lower it. Um yeah, but then it would have uh been hard to do all that quickly plus the aide is talking is only talking hearsay. That assumes it was already up. If Trump was talking to drivers because he had it down already, but it's just a window, so not very uh, easy to lunge through. His hands are quite big. Never underestimate Ge- Geotis. Greatest ever of the United States. Is that what they're doing? Anyways, 
Uh, doesn't matter. He wasn't in that car. Just fucking stupid. He was, he was not. And a lot of people, uh, by the way, are continuing to point this out. Although these people are, you know, the, the word debunked is being thrown around like crazy. Um, just, yeah, I mean, just cause there, yeah, here you go. This is the vehicle he was actually in. There. That's the vehicle. That is not, that's not, he's not in the back part of that. He's not um, in this part. He's sitting right there in the primary seat right here. This is, uh, he could, he could tap this guy on the, the person, the passenger side on the shoulder. He could absolutely lunge for the radio or a butter mint that had fallen down into the gear shift area. It happens. Um, so uh, like the the goofy part of this where they're just like, but there's no possible way. Like, and she was told by these guys this story. If the sto- if they're gonna claim the story is not true, they also have to say under oath that they never told her this story. All she's doing is relaying the story that she heard. And if they can't do that, they have to relay why they would tell her a different story than they are telling under oath. Why would they make up this story for her on that day? So they, and again, the idea is that if they get their story straight and it's them and the president, the president's going to deny it and they're still, you know, Trump sycophants, then why in the world? Yeah. And this, uh, like, and a bunch of these people are jumping on, uh, on this, uh, that it's been debunked. It has by no means been debunked. As a matter of fact, these guys are just jumping on rakes every possible chance they have. It. Why is this? Hold on. That's determinative, and there's no doubt about it. You know, they'd like to say, you know what they say? Oh, that's been uh, debunked. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's, he's talking about the debunked. Um, hold on. Uh, mute. Turn that off. Um, that's just uh, we did this one. This is the one he's he's claiming that like two thousand mules has been debunked. Yeah, it has. By me, and amazingly well. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's de- debunked is one of the big trending things this morning. Good morning. You're watching House Sparks Mega Worldwide. We kind of go through the, the trends on Twitter and then that kind of, uh, sparks, no pun intended, a conversation about the greater sort of ethical, political, psychosexual aspects of, uh, conversation points in our current world. I'm, uh, today's t-shirt is the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, which are technically, I guess, the La Brea asphalt pits. Tar is made. Asphalt is natural. I forget what the whole thing is. There's a big back and forth about this. Um, um, which I think, you know, like that the lap, the, the La Brea asphalt pits would be funny. But then people would try to drive on it. So I think it's smart. Um, um, there's also... A recurring thing. I don't know when they're ever going to learn this lesson, but um, uh, and there's also this side thing of Eastman's phone getting seized, um, unlawfully seized his phone. Yeah, sorry, dude. No, they're going after anybody remotely connected to President Trump. They're seizing emails. They're seizing texts. Okay, you cannot seize either. They are not physical items. They are not removed from you. It's not like seizing an asset. That's why you use those phrases. Also, if they're seizing your phone, they, they'll they return your phone to you if you're found not guilty or you're not involved in a crime, but they have to get a warrant to seize the phone or have probable cause to seize the phone. You got to be engaged in some gnarly shit. The other thing is, and this is it, they're going after anyone remotely connected to Trump. This asshole was, they were basically conjoined twins during January 6th. Eastman is not remotely connected to Trump by any means. He spoke on the Diaz that day. There he is in his stupid outfit because Trump has a thing for lawyers that dress like assholes or tuck their dicks in front of girls they think are 15. Um, This is it. Border Patrol seized enough fentanyl to kill more than 12 million people. We need to secure the border. (laughs) Asshole, that's what we're doing. That's 
that's that's the that's the point. Stupid. They uh, they do this all the time. Let's see. Eighty nine say we're going to have to reach a peace deal with Moscow by ceding territory Russia has seized. Agree. That's another way. Like seized is showing up all over the place. But the the most fascinating thing. Yeah, there she is. Here's the here's the actual full part of it. There you go. Border Patrol seized enough fentanyl to kill more than 12 million people. 12 million people. We need to secure the border. Like, here's, here's, here's the way you make that story work. And I don't want to help anybody that does is is doing this shit in bad faith. But let me let me explain to you how you make this story work. You don't talk about the border when you're talking about illegal shit coming across the border when it's seized because it shows that we're doing a damn fine job of getting it. What you talk about is a person was arrested in Indiana with enough fentanyl to kill it. It has been traced to a cartel in Mexico. Therefore, we need to secure our border. That's how it works. That's how the conversation goes. It's not difficult now, the problem that a lot of them have and why they didn't do more of this, and especially during the Trump years, was because the fentanyl that was being seized or found in greater cities was coming through the mail, not across the border. And uh, that, you know, initially, so if you, if you recognize that you can't vilify people at the border or say it's open or we're not doing it, but plus they wanted to defend Trump from those, you know, those probably because it's the same Border Patrol's trying to stop this shit all the time. Like, people can talk shit about CPV, and there's a bunch of them who are Trump supporters and yada, yada, yada. But the vast majority of human beings get up every day and try to make the world better. And there's a lot of these folks who do the same thing. Like, look, we're trying to, you know, stop illegal immigration, not just because, not because brown people are bad, but because bad people get through and they do bad things. And um, fentanyl itself is a murderous chemical that will kill a lot of people. And we would rather stop that. So they're always stopping trucks and doing all kinds of stuff. Like that. They're just doing their job. Um, they find it all the time, too. During the Trump administration, it was a, when they, a, same, a load like this would be a sign that they, were, that they knew what they were doing, that they were stopping stuff at the border. Now it's a sign that it's getting through, which makes no sense. But nothing has changed materially. Uh, but again, the way that you would make this point, one would think, right? Everybody, chat room? Yes, no, maybe? Um, she could reference the 50 dead people in a truck in Texas. Uh, yeah, she could, except they didn't get very far and they had to abandon their vehicle. And that's why the people died. If it was a porous border and you could just walk on through, A, why are these people dead in a truck? And if, uh, if the drivers just didn't feel any fear whatsoever because the border was open, why did they abandon the truck with a bunch of people in it who died? None of it works. Like the, the, the reality is, is that we, we have an enormous border. There are economic and geopolitical reasons why the southern border in particular is is and shall always be more porous than the waterways on either side of the country or the fucking Canadian border, which, by the way, the 9-11 hijackers came in through Canada, the ones that didn't just fly straight into the country. So they that was their border, right? <laughs> it's silly. The whole conversation about it is is childish and and does not answer the very real, normal, perfunctory governmental activities necessary to have a functioning immigration system and all that stuff. They just, it's just a, it, it's a ping pong ball. It's a, it's a talking point that they can use. Good morning, everybody. The wall needs to be done. The wall, you know, didn't you hear Trump? The wall is done. <laughs> he finished it. He was just going to finish more of what he was going to finish. That was the storyline. Anyways, um, the, the the wall isn't going to have a material effect on it either. The parts that were unfinished are gates, gates that apparently is are not going to be used. It's just so stupid. That's why they weren't finished. Because it was, uh, I'm slightly out of sync. It happens. Um, wonder why that is. I'll switch screens and hopefully it'll straighten itself out. Hold on. Sometimes that happens because of. Uh, audio issues on these things. Let me move this out of the way. 
go back to here. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Hello. Yeah, big chunks of the wall are falling down as well. Because to support them, you'd need to put um, kind of uh, triangulated bases on them, which would make them easier to scale. Unless you want to hyper support them on the other side. And they didn't, I don't know why they didn't want to do that. It's just stupid. Like, it's just because you wanted it. It's not even, it's not even a wall. It's a slat fence. If the audio is out of sync, just refresh the page in your browser. Yeah, that might not be me. There's been a lot of hits on YouTube and a lot of hits on Twitch and stuff lately. Just be aware. Especially during lovely shows like me. Um, uh, hey, Liberal Dan. I'm gonna, by the way, I'll, I'm going to be on Liberal Dan's show uh, later on today, tonight. Um, for uh, for an hour to hang out. If that's uh, cool, you want to jump over there, I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll jump. I'll take a small break after my show this afternoon and then hop over there. Um, piece of the wall fell into Mexico from the rain. By the way, I would like to remind everybody who's pro-wall, um, the wall largely has to be built on some private land. So you use eminent domain as a way of the government seizing land and building the wall on it. And when Trump did that, he took U.S. land, American land, just in case you're all Maggie, and he split it to build a wall on it and effectively gave land to Mexico. That's right. Donald Trump, first president in a hundred and some odd years to give land, American territory, to Mexico. Well, well played, asshat. So um, let me uh, go back in here and then I'll... Um, Let's see. I got a bunch of stuff since uh, Philip's going to be joining us at some point. We're hoping. Um, the uh, I've got a bunch of stuff to kind of catch you up on what's going on in Ukraine as of the day. Because that's like Wednesdays has become our kind of uh, catch up day to deal with um, what's going on in Ukraine, kind of ongoing conflict there. And there's been a huge amount of movement. Um, geopolitically, and then, of course, uh, in terms of long-range weaponry. And it's staging up, and effectively, there's a slow crawl towards what will be a very heavy August. Um, one of the talking points I continually hear from the, uh, the you know, the Jimmy Dore denazification is real crowd is this idea that the Ukrainians have been... Um, bombing the Donbass since 2014 and 54,000 people have been killed because of the Ukrainians bombing Donbass. Okay, never mind the fact that this was a hot war between separatist factions fueled by Russia on purpose, territory seized by Russia, that they we now know from their own statements and from their creation of these two autonomous regions and the the fake vote they're putting forward in these autonomous regions to just become part of Russia. We know now that the last eight years storyline, even around the Minsk agreement was all horseshit. It was all puffery. It was just a way to delay things while they could, they could salami slice more of the land towards himself. But there was an ongoing fight where Russia was trying to take territory from Ukraine and Ukraine was trying to keep their territory from being taken by Russia. And so there was definitely a hot war back and forth. Um, the fifth, the 52 to 54,000 number that gets bandied about, um, of those people, a little over 3000 have been civilians killed in, since 2014 of those 3000 civilians killed 2000 of them were killed in the first fighting around 2014. Since then, Russia has effectively uh, done this sort of act of fortification where they're, these places are becoming less towns and more military outposts. So, uh, yeah, and then the idea that, you know, they're, they're definitely kidnapping children and Ukrainians, but they are also using part of that as cover to remove um, personnel and citizens that they put into those areas to kind of you know, seed population in these areas so that they can tip the balance of a vote to join Russia and all that stuff because actual Russian citizens were moved in there. Now they're moving them back out because the war heated up again and they can't afford to lose anybody. That's just 
but just like just factor that in. So the 54,000 number of 51 to 54,000 killed since 2014 in the fighting in the Donbass region between Ukraine and Russia, um, 3,000 people in the last, you know, 10 years, 12 years, um, have been, were, were killed, uh, were, were civilians. 2,000 of those killed in the very beginning of the fighting, 1,000 over the course of, you know, nine years, essentially. So just to clarify that part, because there's been a lot of that, that bullshit gets bandied about a, a ridiculous amount. So um, now let's go to the news on it. Let me see if I can, I'm going to go up to here and move this over here. There you go. So you guys can see this a little better. Yeah. Chip, where are you going, buddy? Chip's running around like a maniac. Um, so... Uh, Ukraine's going to join NATO, just get used to that idea. Um, and whether Russia, we quote, once you, you know, the whole, like we're fighting in Ukraine cause we don't want NATO on our doorstep and NATO pressurization and blah, blah, blah. okay. They just told Finland and Sweden, they don't give a shit if they join NATO. So the idea that L Ukraine would matter is garbage. That doesn't make any sense. The border, the Finnish border is bigger than Ukrainian border. And it's strategically like... It's equidistant in some places to Moscow by a little bit. Wouldn't matter, you know, in so far as missile range and shit like that. And it's closer to St. Petersburg and the and strategic ports and could sever their relationship with Kaliningrad almost entirely now that Lithuania is like, fuck you. So it's like, it's a little goofy. But anyways, um, this is why, uh, like, they're talking about, like, the benefit of of Ukraine joining, it would give a, a 300 plus percent military power addition, 40,000 troops under direct NATO command. This is the Eastern flank, uh, 130 allied aircraft, uh, 140 ships at sea, hundred thousand us troops, uh, deployed to Europe. This is, and, and Biden's been talking about, there's going to be a, a permanent forward base in Poland now. And this could be a result of us the over-reliance on Germany for years as one of our main bases for, for the U.S. military. So if you'll recall, stuff that happened in the Middle East, people would go to, they'd go to Germany for medical treatment and that kind of stuff, or that would be the staging area. Well, Germany's relationship with Russia has been, you know, uh, much um, discussed during this whole endeavor. And there's been a concern that they are less um, reliable than some of the other NATO states because of that very fact, because they they politically allow themselves to be aligned with this. This is where, you know, Trump's whole waving the white flag stuff that he was talking about where he gave Angela Merkel the thing. Okay, all that shit he was talking was not his own idea. This is something that the State Department's been working on with Germany forever and still does. And one of the solutions is, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And so instead of having this giant primary focal point in Germany, div divide the space up a little bit. And Poland can, you know, it, it's more helpful, uh, helpful to bring Poland in line. So um, this uh, this part's just kind of fascinating. Um, so uh, this is the current state of affairs. And the idea is that you could uh, almost double most of this stuff by, you know, adding Ukraine to this, especially in terms of soldiers. So it, that's a huge deal. And it's effectively because at the, by the time it all shakes out and, and things normalize, by the way, see this little area right in here where my mouse is, see that that's Kaliningrad. That's a, technically a chunk of Russia. And uh, Lithuania has just said, if you want to take your, sh if you want shit to come to and from Lithuania or to and from Kaliningrad from Russia, you got to go around. You got to bring it by boat all the way from up here. Basically, the, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline route um, instead of bringing it through our land, which is one of the biggest things that's pissing off Russia. And, and why would that be? Well, one of the reasons is, is this is a waypoint to get stuff through here this little border region uh, down along Ukraine and into Moldova. So it's a, like, this is shit the Russia's been 
teeing up for years. I I am still convinced, however naive I might have been along with everybody else in the 90s, that ultimately the, uh, the, the glasnost, while it was well-meaning and realistic and something that you know, Gorbachev was actually pushing for, and arguably Yeltsin as well. The KGB people, people behind him were all well past. This was they were turning it into a rope a dope. This was the USSR never fell. They were just biding their time because they couldn't afford to keep up with everybody else, and they knew that the West would go. You know, as long as you want to join the rest of the world and not attack everybody, you could do. You know, do your work. We'll do with you what we what we're doing with China. We don't. You know, China's totally communist but we can interact with them as they're opening up. You could do the same thing. We're not telling you how to live, but as long as you don't stop taking and, you know, threatening to take enormous amount of lives is the theory. Well, they just went, okay, we'll pretend to for a while. So, um, <laughs> this is, uh, Anthony Blinken, but they're, uh, Anthony, Anthony, that is a picture backdrop. I'm just saying that's a step and repeat. That's not the, they're not outside in front of that place. I'm just going to say, uh, I'm guessing just because of the, the lighting on the water bottle and the fact that it's paper. <laughs> um, oh dear. Um, oh yes. Uh, Russian strike at the shopping mall that this is, they, they have the missile. They, they, they have the footage of the actual missile in Kremenchik. And they can, like, you can make out the shape of it. I know 9-11, how, where's the thing? Was it a plane that hit the pen? Okay, that was 2000. Cameras are better now. Shut up. And a lot better. Imagine your job today if you're in a UFO. It, it used to be so easy to keep your UFO hidden. Now you've got to, you know, have some sort of massive cloaking device that's in 4K. Good morning, Kenneth. Good morning, Dee Dee. Hey, Wes. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Kath. Welcome. Uh, Sean Slant had any was only relevant uh, because he was an ass. <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> um, part of uh, it's it's pretty fascinating to see like the the tap dance at Fox where they I mean, they honestly they have a really hard time right now um, defending the conversations between Laura Ingram and uh, and Sean Hannity, because again, consider what they say about the liberal media and how the Democrats and the liberal media and big tech are all aligned and they're working hand in glove and they're all the same and blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, we know for a fact that not only was Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and all these, they, they have constant direct personal access to the president anytime they wanted it, but they were effectively unhired advisors, but both telling him what to do, you know, giving him advice and reinforcing that advice on the shows that they knew he watched as an audience of one on a lot of cases on their show until the cat got out of the bag and they, you know, they had to deal with the fact that they, you know, Frankenstein never really has control of his monster, no matter how much, uh, it's, it seems to like the, the sound of the violin. Um, Let's see. Uh, Defense Secretary Ben Wallace uh, said today that they believe 25,000 Russians have been killed in Ukraine. Yeah, they're talking that when you hear the number, by the way, of um, Russians versus you know, like the, the number of killed and you'll hear like 36,000 or something like that, that they're including killed and wounded. Basically, the idea is that the Ukrainians are going to count anybody who's been removed from the battlefield, no longer able to fight. They don't care if the person is dead. It's not that personal at this point for the Ukrainian troops. They just want that person to never be able to fight again. That's And that's most of the time how casualties are thought of. That's why they often call them casualties as opposed to killed, you know, just KIA numbers. Speaking at the NATO summit in Madrid, Mr. Wallace told LBC, I would still say the Ukrainians are winning. They're extracting huge amounts of cost from Russian armed forces. 25,000 Russians we think have been killed in the fight in the space of 112, 115 days. Russia has failed on all its major objectives. It's now reduced to grinding advance a few hundred meters every few days at massive cost in one small part of eastern Ukraine along two or three axes. This is not a victory in anyone's book. Um, here's the Ukraine Army blog uh, showing their launch of stuff. They're in a farming field. Anybody know what they're growing there? It's, they're planting missile trees. It's mistletoe. Sorry. 
<laughs> Sorry. That's bad. I apologize. It was smart and quick, but it was still bad. Um, Russian Freedom Legion, Russian patriots fighting against Putin's fascist regime are on the front line of Ukraine. Putin, we are coming for your head. Oh, yeah, these are the Russians that are fighting for Ukraine there who want a free, you know, that, that idea. These are, these are like Navalny supporters in theory who have gone, you know, they're like, this is how we can help bring this about. We're never, you know, if they march in the streets of, uh, of Moscow, they're just going to get arrested. Yipes. Everybody get down. The dog's okay. Look at these guys. That just blew up and now they're running toward it. Jesus. I guess they're going, in, you know, in case it's a building, they're there to clear buildings and get people out. Get back here, dog. I, the dog's making me nervous. Like, he looks like a dingo. Jesus. I, I guess they. Pres this is ticks. This is uh, troops in con in contact. So the. Um, they're they don't. This isn't like a. They don't believe that hit was a far away thing. Good lord. Um. That's them firing from a trench. There's this dude and his wife. There are these guys again. 95 heroes from a Vostal return to Ukraine. This is the largest exchange of prisoners since the beginning of the war. Yeah, they, um, <laughs> so much for, by the way, that, that bullshit idea that they're doing this to denazify the place for the record, because they just, and that the Azov battalion is all Nazis because the Russians just gave back a bunch of Azov battalion guys who were in the Mariupol steel factory. And, and the interesting thing is, the younger ones wouldn't be the neo-Nazi dudes. They, they, it would be these guys age-wise. Um, but they apparently gave these guys back. So I guess they're, they, it's, it's a lend-lease denazification, according to Russia at this point. There are 10,000 Ukrainian POWs in. Kiev only wants to get Azov out. Crazy, to be honest. That's Russians with attitude. Allegedly Jewish president of Ukraine only wants Nazi Azov. Yeah, see, that makes total sense. That's the argument that they're making, is that these are the folks that they, you know, uh, uh, was denazifying Russian, Russian lieutenant colonel. Because okay, this is one of their uh, LTs. Um, okay, yeah, they're having meetings about this stuff, and this is Biden. Biden talk about uh, uh, let's see, Ukraine wants wins today. The West is looking at twenty twenty three. They're not, there's no, Jesus Christ. Does anybody think they're not, this isn't a two front product? Like just because you only have a narrow um, like range of topics that you can focus on either as a writer or as a paper that everybody else isn't doing shit all the time. It's almost, can you imagine if, if a newspaper wrote like in a, in a shift towards defense, America stops fighting disease so like they uh, with the with the raising of the military budget america you know close is closing the cdc or the nih which is not true at all just because you're ignoring it uh what do you mean by saying can you imagine if you are in your spaceship why how many personal spaceships are out there nowadays and if we buy one do we have like getting hit by extremists uh i don't know we got some, you know, welcome trolls, by the way. Welcome, everybody who's joining. It's nice to have you here, uh, especially in the uh, outer world of the um, of my setup. I, I promise I will take the map down and start, you know, Glenn Becking that whiteboard very soon with stuff so you guys can keep, you know, you know see, um, you know, goal expression and stuff. Uh, opinion. Putin wants to terrorize Ukraine in submission. It's not working. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I don't know why they think it's going to work. Honest to God. Um, yeah, 95. Um, a Vestal defenders returned home in POW exchange. Among them, 43 are from Azov. His first Azov. Yeah. These, uh, and by the way, the Azov, 
the C is named Azov. The Azov Battalion is geographic. I mean, honest to God, like it's it's like during the Revolutionary War, if the British had just decided to to uh, say that the Kentucky militia are are Klansmen, and therefore it's the Ku Klux Kentucky, you know, Kentucky Ku Klux Klan, and anybody that's returned from the you know, it's taken as a prisoner of war from the Kentucky militia is now officially a neo-Nazi because we say so. P.S. You can have them back so they can keep fighting. What the fuck that's supposed to be? It's gibberish. Um, yeah, so this is what he's talking about. Biden's uh, boosting U.S. troops in Europe because of Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, there will be a um, Fifth Army Corps is going to have a permanent headquarters in Poland. Doesn't mean there'll be a giant base, but they will expand the base that they have and will have a, a geopolitical and strategic relationship with Poland where that's there. Um, there you go. And uh, demonstration in support of Ukraine for the NATO summit in Madrid. And by the way, I, uh, yeah, it's nice to have a, you know, a demonstration in support of Ukraine as opposed to a protest in front. It's a good sign, I think, when people sh show up to go, yeah, m this we're for this. This is a good thing. Um, Ukraine exchange, yeah, that's so that's that's a big part of the conversation that's happening right now. Oh, and the Saint Javelin shirts that they're printing in Ukraine is so weird. It's made in Dnipro. Like I and 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 like her her halo has the Ukrainian symbol in it, the trident. And stuff. It's it's such a strange aspect of modern life. I mean, you know, in the in the in World War One, World War Two, and that kind of stuff, it wasn't that uncommon. You could argue that these are kind of the modern, uh, slightly more evolved version of like um, what we would now consider racist uh, Warner Brothers cartoons around the war. You know what I mean? It, like, because this is pro your side as opposed to anti the other side specifically um and it's just artwork done to show your support for the the cause in that regard um um yeah this is uh yeah this is their hit on in Kharkiv a city they don't at all have so they're just firing long range stuff into it and the the generals that are involved cuz they have no um main like you know they they're non commissioned officers they don't have that class so they're that's where the concern about a tactical nuclear weapon comes from, is that a general can can launch one of those without permission from the Kremlin. That's how their system is set up. And so the concern is, is that these assholes will just, because they're lunatics, eventually just tire of whatever large munitions they have and try one of those because they have the right and ability to do. And, and, and there's a question about whether or not uh, Russia has turned off the uh, you know, taking the leash off entirely, or if it's technically allowed, but they stop it from happening. Anyways. Um, let's see. Hartman is a dope for having him on. He doesn't deserve a platform mark. Oh, are uh, we talking about, uh, um, Richard Wolf or I said lunch, not launch. Right. Well, hi Nina. Thank you for supporting. Uh, yes. Thanks Nina. Sorry, I, I get, uh, my, I have limited screen space. So when I'm doing the, when I'm showing this kind of stuff, I have to bring that page forward so I can read it while I'm showing it to you. And I can't see the chat when I do it. And I apologize. I, I wish there was a cleaner way of doing this. There just is not. So, um, oh, there you go. Ne I scrolled back. Nina, thank you. Uh, bless you. I, I'm, gl I'm so glad I can be of service. That's the, that's the primary reason I'm here. We, we want to be, you know, remind everybody that this stuff, all of this stuff is genuinely uh, awful. There's, this is life happening right in front of you. And anybody who lived through, you know, the AIDS crisis, 9-11, um, the 2008 crash, and, and uh, any myriad of people who are alive who were alive during Vietnam or that, I mean, even the Cold War itself, um, you know that you can't skip history. And so this stuff is going to happen. And so you have to have a certain amount of, I, I believe, optimistic stoicism and resolve. 
because that's the only thing that ultimately will stop you from being uh, desensitized. Hold on one second. Oh, I see. Oh, it's in the dual screen. That's not what I... Oh, because I've got... Most of the time, I've got these guys in here. Um, bing, there you go. Um, and I think, that, like, optimistic stoicism is probably the best way I could define my personal philosophy. Or at least the, what I strive for in my personal philosophy. Sorry, uh, let's see. Somebody <laughs> picked a bad week to stop sniffing. Take over Glenn Beck Studio. I totally want to, Betsy. It's going to take a lot more than you know super chats. So I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to clear at least half a million subscribers before that's an option. Carl, I do need a third monitor. The problem is, is that this is just my smaller computer on my desk out here, but it's got eCam on it, so that's the one that I use for interviews and stuff. I, what I really need to do is shift Johnny and Phil and everybody to either uh, OBS Ninja or Skype and get them into my other setup. But the problem with that is, is routing audio out to Chicago and back. It's always the problem. And the Mac software loopback that I use that while it has occasional glitching and it hasn't, they haven't updated it for the M1 currently is the closest thing I have to being able to do that with, you know, relatively streamlined. Um, so that's, that's my constant struggle right now is that, if, and that's, you'll, you'll notice that's also why I do the Saturday show, the radio show out here, as opposed to with my other setup, you know, where technically it's better shaped for that kind of stuff. Thanks James for hitting the like. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, yeah, smash the like. Give it a thumbs up if you want to. You do not have to do the notification bell. I don't don't believe the rusty trombone hype. Uh, yeah. So, um, can't figure out how to buy a super chat at the bottom of your of the chat. There should be a little symbol. Looks like a dollar sign. That's where you, you can click on that, or you can do super stickers. Kiss is playing on Pandora at my gym right now. Beautiful. You know what was funny is I I was in Home Depot the other day and they were playing music in the Home Depot. It's very strange that it was relatively loud and it was kind of like a 70s playlist and Hard Luck Woman came on and I was like, that's awesome. Finally. How long does it take to get some street cred for those songs? Okay. Norway's given three more L uh, MLRS, MLRSs. Um, it's like the RUOS is the rodents of unusual size. Uh, I'm, uh, RUS is, I'm going to call them that. Carl's, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Oh, we got those folks again. Lovely. Hold on. Now I got to, and then even this, when I need to deal with, uh, uh, issues within the chat, as far as, uh, when we get marauders, there we go. I have to do it on my iPad instead of on, uh, cause I don't have another monitor and I can't open up another window at the same time. It's just, the struggle is real. Just saying, this is what, now you know why I get so mad when I watch Glenn Beck show and he's got all these screens and all of them just have logos on them. What a waste of time. Uh, can I debate Tim pool? Sure. On what, what topic? Just in general, his existence, beanie versus no beanie. Yeah, we're enjoying this. We get the sexy time trolls. You have a privacy setting on your phone and computer. It's true. I, I've seen videos of them firing. Oh, thank you, Andrea. I appreciate that. Yeah, the, when we get those, uh, ra those adult accounts that try to jump in, um, Banning them is great, but it's better to click on them, go to their channel, and report them for spam because they're basically set up that way. That, that stops them not just, by the way, that way we're doing a community service. We're not just doing it for our chat. We're doing it for everybody. And that's one of the areas also that you as a chatter can, if you're not a moderator, you can help with that. It won't automatically kick them out, but you know, hopefully on a normal YouTube review, that will get rid of them over time. I mean, they keep building new ones. It doesn't matter. They, they crank these things out. Um, 
<laughs> just just two fun guys out on the town. Um, I'm Ukrainian. Russians kill me for what? Oh, uh, Russians kill me for that. I see. I thought it said for what? Kill Ukraine for what? Oh, here you go. Uh, say puppy is happy. People and animals in Ukraine after suffering uh, equally from Russian Nazis. They, oh, there he goes. Get out there, buddy. Come on. Crawl out onto the platform. Poor little guy. There you go. Going for a ride. There you go. Get the person out of the building. Make sure they're not going down flights of stairs that might collapse. There you go. Oh, and this is a uh, Russian transport truck struck by artillery fire, uh, mechanized brigade. These are, um, yeah, they, I mean, they get spotted by drones and then they hide in the trees and, and yeah. Notice the houses remain intact. Notice how they wait. Nothing's perfect, but this is a huge deal. 35,450 troops, 35,450 troops, 217 planes. It's like uh, the Russian version of rent. Um, and uh, there we go. This is the losses as of June 29. Armored personnel vehicles, 14 boats. That's kind of the one that stands out to me. They've lost 14 boats to a country that has no navy. And and honest to God, if they've lost a sub, we wouldn't know it. It's very possible that they've lost one of their subs. But because there, it was hit um, and it would have sunk below the surface and kind of hid there, it wouldn't have been one of these, like, you can obviously see it exploding from, you know, from the sky. It might just look like an explosion in the water. And since they're hiding and they're moving around, you can't, you don't get to see them necessarily before they go down. Um that's a that's a lot of stuff. A lot of very expensive stuff. How many EM50s? I don't see a listing of there. I mean, it might be under Yeah, uh, either under special equipment or just under troop stuff. Oh god. I can't. Is it uh, mass graves? This this kid singing the Ukrainian uh, anthem while they're bandaging her foot. <laughs> She's like, how'd you hurt your foot? Shoving it up Putin's ass. 907 people in the chat on the morning show. I can remember when that was our top out number in the evening show. That's amazing. I can remember when that was our top out number on the radio show. Yeah, 35,000 dead soldiers is it. Yes, wow. And that's the, oh God. Fuck. Just a, a friggin' buried child. Uh, is Russia throwing their A game out there right now? I don't think so. I don't want them to either for the record. Uh, yes, they are. The The illusion, the, the, the question was, did they even have an A game in the first place? That's what everyone's questioning. And the idea is that if they were going to, it was certainly when they were going to try and take Kiev. The primary plan was to take Kiev. That failed miserably. And their fallback, they're dusting off tanks from this. From the, they have 70-year-old tanks. Hi, Chip. Can I help you? What are you doing, buddy? Come here. Come here, Chip. He was trying to crawl up through the arm of my chair and he couldn't fit because he's too big now. But I didn't have time to move around so he could hop up. My cat, for those of you that are new. Yeah, they have no A game. Honestly, I mean, at this point, unless you're talking atomic, where they're just like, they've relied so much on mutual assured destruction to keep them, uh, you know, like, to scare everybody into too, being too afraid to fight back, which is what they did. How many dead Russian generals? Uh, current count that I know of, 15. I think that's the number. 14 confirmed, one uh, an additional possible. We'll look that up in a minute. Uh, 
uh, yeah. Ukrainian Panzer Halbitsa 2000 self-propelled howitzer in action. This is, uh, um, yeah, that's, those are the movable ones, like the ones the French sent. Yeah, that's the, that's the one that they're showing. Um, yeah, the president of Indonesia just went, uh, to Ukraine as well, partnering. Drone footage, Ukrainian artillery units targeting Russian positions and equipment. This is, it, they sit there and they watch them a bunch because they've taken over these certain areas, whatever. But there's a military vehicle. See the Z on top of it? And they'll hit over here. They're trying to, they're, they're, they're basically dialing it in, trying to hit the vehicles themselves. Boom. Oh, there they go. There's the guys. And then they're bugging out. And then they got the building. Right. Because basically they took over this uh, like cement quarry or whatever and have been using it as a military base is the idea. Nobody's working currently. There's another. That's a, that's a troop transport. There's, they've got a bag on top of it because there's a Z on the top. You can see the outline of the Z. Um... That's the mall that the Russians hit. And then he they bragged about it. They they bragged about it. They were like, look what we did. Fifteen uh, hundred seventy two tanks lost in a few months. We only lost twenty three Abrams and nine small ones, and seven of those were friendly fire. Russia sucks at war. They thank God. Again, this is one of those things like as awful as this is, just like January 6th, thank God the people who are in charge of this shit are morons. Now, there is an argument I would make that narcissism and truly clever strategic thinking are to some degree mutually exclusive. That narcissism itself will keep you from you know, working out the flaws in your plan because you kind of can't even allow yourself to believe there are any. And so uh, that's one of the biggest flaws. That was Hitler's, argu arguably his biggest flaw. It was Caesar's biggest flaw. You know, is the idea that if you can't look at, and then, or at least have the guts to surround yourself with people that will question your moves and will go, look, I know you don't like to think about how this could, go south, but it could go south this way, this way, and this way. you got to at least have those people around so you can listen to them and go, okay, if it did go that way, what would I do? Because I'm a genius, right? You have to factor that into your narcissism. That's arguably the Genghis Khan way of operating. But the current situation, yeah, narcissism's, narcissists want yes men. That's exactly right. And the case with Trump was that he started brooming anybody who was giving him bad news, even if those people who were giving him the bad news were like, okay, it's bad news, but we have this genuine option. He didn't want to hear those things because it meant facing the fact that he was a loser. The same thing is happening, I would argue, with, with Putin right now. He has surrounded himself with morons because he, he cannot... Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, you know, he, he cannot stomach you know, at least, uh, hold on, I'm moving my screens around. He can't stomach the idea that anybody might know more about it, this. Yeah. Napoleon, another great example. Can't stomach the idea that anybody might know more about it than he. And so when you see an authoritarian narcissist, their success scheme will always have a, a glass ceiling on it, a permanent border. That, and that's genuinely, geopolitically, strategically, interpersonally in your life. And they'll learn, by the way, they'll learn how to operate amazingly efficiently within that bubble. And it's often grotesque and they will often go farther than most people will go. And they'll let themselves off the hook, you know, to, to do all kinds of evil and give you the illusion that, oh, if they ever move past that border with their actions, they could be just as devastating on a grander thing. So you know what? Let's all step back and not 
do anything about it because if it ever got unleashed, it would be equally as effective outside as it is inside. And that is not the case. Absolutely, Marson. <laughs> they, they will always outsmart themselves. Yeah. East Day residents of Ukrainian city and towns play chicken with their lives. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lauren Wolf's in, in Ukraine right now, too. I followed her on Twitter for a while. Um, Richard Wolf. Ugly truth leaks out. High gas prices, huge oil coming. Result from oil companies' profit strategies. Neither Ukraine nor Russia are to blame. They are just scapegoats made to save oil companies from criticism and trolls. Uh, bullshit. This is not, uh, the, nobody's saying Ukraine and the Russian uh, war are uh, on Ukraine is the primary reason for this. Oil dropped below 30 to negative $36 a barrel. You couldn't give it away. And if you didn't move it, you, you literally had to pay people to take it. If you didn't move it and you shut the pipes, starting those pipes back up again is devastating. We are a million barrels short of production of where we were in 2018, 2019. And we are almost 3 million barrels short of refining capacity because of people at factories and the like. It, they, if you, whatever you make for a living, if you, if you had to give it away for, at, for slave wages or for free for a year, the next year, if you could charge for it, you're going to try and make up for that, especially if you have investors. Like it's just, is there some gouging going on? Yes, but it has nothing to do with this shit. It's a, it's an oversimplification. It's dumb and it forgets that we just went through COVID. Like this is just ugly truth. Like get the fuck out of here. <laughs> How a massive refinery shortage is contributing to high gas prices. Oil refinery have lost capacity over recent years, making it nearly impossible to increase supply and stabilize gas prices at the pump. Recent years. The ugly truth leaks out. Good for fuck's sake. Um, yeah, that I don't know what got blown up here. This is in Ukraine. Oh, Philip's with us. Hold on one second. I will bring him in and he can join us in just a second. We got an hey, there he is. Hey, <laughs> hey. hey, hold on. I'm gonna bring you in to the shot. There you are. Let me move this up here. I'm going to put you in the corner so you can see stuff. There you what go. What am I watching there? That is an explosion that just happened somewhere in Ukraine. Um, oh, we don't God. have a, a direct confirmation. Like this is this is definitely over in the east someplace. But I, it, I look. I literally, I literally drove. I've been driving all day, and I've been in Kiev all of maybe an hour. And I, I was dropped off by a kid who was doing a rideshare thing. Wow. And I did it uh, because the trains only run at night, I presume, for security reasons. So I was able to get a ride from this guy. It took about eight hours because his car broke down halfway through. Wow. So don't let it be said that I don't care about the audience because I came never. right here. That's right. I came I would, straight here. I would never so say. Welcome, welcome yeah. to a very buggy, humid um, Kiev. I can tell that it's been really hot and muggy here because my apartment, which has been closed, yes. is like a sauna. Right. And I can tell, you know, you know those rainstorms where you can tell it's the humidity that's broken? Yes. The, 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 the hot, hum well, that's kind of what's going on right now. So it's, it feels kind of nice, but also at the same time, a little, a little bit still humid. A little thick, a little and, sticky. Uh, anyhow, I ran, I ran straight here. I stopped off and grabbed myself something to eat. For later, because my the restaurants close at around nine, which yeah. is in roughly an hour. So, but I got here as quickly as I could. So, what Dude, do you want to talk about? Great. You did great. I I've been going over a couple of things uh, just in the current news. Caught people up on um, like the current number of losses by the Russians. This uh, this expansion of um, NATO forces, NATO. especially in Poland, where uh, the U.S. Army will have uh, you know a, a division, yep. a permanent place there. Um, for the fifth, it, fifth, uh, fifth army, I think that's it is. That's right. Yeah. Which, uh, you I know. caught bullet points as I was driving up, I was able to kind of keep, right. keep my eye on things, but it was spotty sometimes. And I, and I promise, I know people like the full beard, but now that I'm back in Kiev, I'm going to go to the barber. I'm sorry. It's it, just too much. He's going to get it tightened. Right. 
Um, but uh, anyways, hi, how are you? How was the drive? What'd you see on your way? I mean, the, on an interpersonal uh, level, well, I'm curious about that part of it, I think, as a lot of people are. Well, okay, so I'll explain to you what uh, the process was. I was going to go on the overnight train last night back from Odessa. Right. But there is a ride there's a ride sharing service here. Uh, you know, the, the, the Ukrainians are very tech savvy yeah. and um, very affordable. And so, and I would prefer to drive, I would prefer to travel in the day as yeah. opposed to the night. Um, and so I was able to find a spot in this 24 uh, year old's car. And, um, and he picked up a, another young lady. I was easily the oldest one in the car. Um, and, um, we drove up together. His car broke down outside of Cherkasy, uh, and we had to stop for about two hours while the mechanics worked on it, fixed it, and then and it's it was blisteringly wow. hot uh, until we got about uh, two hours outside of Kiev when we hit the rainstorm, and uh, I mean it was a real torrential downpour as these things often are when kind of the weather breaks. Yeah, and so. Um, it was, you know, going through deep things of, of water and all the rest. So that slowed us down. Right. Um, coming into Kiev, there was a very large uh, security block, which I had not gone through because I go through. I've gone. I've come here mostly on trains, and right. so they stop you at the station, and it's a little bit more controlled. But but people driving into the capital, there was a real backlog, and um, you know we got checked. We got on the road up here in the roughly eight hours with the two hour layover with the mechanical problems. We got stopped five separate times at five separate um, roadblocks and they checked wow. our identification and they were a sure. little bit skeptical of me as an American because uh -huh. it's, a, it's unusual. Yeah. And they, they kind of were like, well, what are you doing here? And, you know, what yeah. not, not that they were like malicious or like suspect. They were just like, what do you what, what why we don't see foreigners that often right um what's your deal and so i showed them my press card and they were like oh, okay fine yeah um so uh about four or five uh roadblocks on the highway from odessa to uh kiev and then the big one outside the, the capital itself got dropped off the outskirts because the kid who was driving the car uh was going to get it. He, he's now presumably what he told me his plan was is he's now going to take it to a proper mechanic and get it really checked out because there's something wrong with his clutch. Right. But then he's going to drive on to Kharkiv. He's going Ooh. to Kharkiv tomorrow. Oh shit. Well, his family's from there and his yeah. brother is there. And so he's, he's determined to go and link up with his brother in Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, more power to him, but, um, you know, you, you got to worry. Right. Uh, Thank you, then, Carlos. And then, I, and then I ran I ran down to grab some food before coming here as the right. last thing because I knew that once we started talking that, that we were probably going to go past the 9 o'clock. Um, restaurants tend to close around 9 o'clock here. Right. Um, it, it bumps up. It starts to get close to curfew, and they're just, you know, people don't stay yeah. out late. So I stopped off a local restaurant where I, I'm kind of my regular go-to, just grabbed a burger that I'll heat up. And I had a quick chat with them and, um, and talked to them about, they asked me what the situation was in Odessa. I did a little bit um, You know, two days ago when they got really hit hard, was difficult for them, they said. And then, um, and then they had lightning storms last night and they kind of in gallows humor were joking about the fact that a lot of people were calling in or reporting on um, social media and kind of reporting the sites that you can you can call in on or report in on it that, that the Russians were attacking again, but really it was just thunder. And um, and they kind of chuckled about that. So a little bit of gallows humor, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I, it's too early for me to gauge how much the city has changed in the three weeks that I've been away. Right. So I'll, I'll investigate that tomorrow and we'll talk about it on Saturday. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, you know, I was more kind of interested in just like, um, view out the window and, and the experience of, you know, traveling through the space. 
of a country at war. Yeah. Yeah. Besarovsky, Besarovsky Market, which is always lovely. Right. Um, Heretofore, I, mean, I refer to as pickle land. I still care. I don't, I don't, I mean, the cars are out, people are out. I don't get a sense that they've, re, they've regressed to the sense of, you know, lockdown and get ready to run for shelters. Right. At the second of an air raid siren. I, I, I think people are, are resistant to going back to that level of security. But we'll have to see if the Russians keep pounding the place because they have started a new tactic of trying to overwhelm. You know, they've been hitting through all throughout Ukraine. And the difference is that they're not doing it in salvos of like, you know, five, eight, ten, you know, missiles at a time. Now they're trying to flood the zone and yeah. overwhelm their anti-air, anti, um, anti-missile anti systems. And that's why they've been able to get through. And it's and that's why the announcement of an anti, uh, you know, missile defense system coming from the it's states is so welcome. Yeah, so yeah. people catch people up on that because that just that's a relatively new. Um, yeah, well, Biden, I think it was yeah. at the tail end of the G seven. Mm-hmm. He said that they were going to send an anti uh, an anti missile system, which I I have not had time. I will admit to research what exactly the system is. I do right. not think it's the Patriot system. I do not no. think it's Iron Dome. No, it is not. I don't think we would give that to the Ukrainians, um, just because I think the Russians would go nuts. Yeah, um, but we are providing them with, and they need it, and they want it, and so, um, uh, yeah. you know, that'll be a welcome addition for them. Um, right. They they have also they've welcomed, um, you know, the announcement of of, uh, of Sweden and Finland uh, overcoming the Turkish objections and and joining NATO. They're happy to hear that. Mm-hmm. Um trying to think what else what else they have been talking about i mean they're furious about crim and chuck as they should be the mall the mall i just showed people the footage um, of that and that that missile the mall, the mall and chuck where a thousand right. yeah people were in there i'm gonna yeah, bring this potentially up potentially a thousand civilians at a shopping mall of absolutely no strategic military importance um they're furious about that uh, you know, this is the, by the way, this uh, is a still image of the yeah. missile striking it. Um, and I mean, it's like literally it's a, it's very distinctly a Russian missile. It's like, it's not even close. It's not one of these things where like, yeah, they all kind of look like this is a specific design. Uh, M the MS 22 or whatever it is. Um, I forget the name of it, but this is and it's an anti-ship it. missile. It's not yeah. even that's not even the purpose for what it's it's right. created. It's supposed to sink capital ships, and by that I mean aircraft carriers, destroyers, right. you know, really, really big uh, uh, ships, uh, yeah. naval ships, and that's the purpose for it. And it's it, you know, they could have potentially killed a lot. Well, they could, did kill a lot of civilians. Right. Um, uh, you know, but it could have been it could have been triple digits. Yes. Uh, so thankfully, they evacuated the place and um, it, the the death toll is comparatively low, but still unacceptable to the Ukrainians, not only because of the. I mean, just losing, you know, I last I heard it was 18, but I'm sure that's risen since I last checked. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they were targeting something that has absolutely nothing to do right. with um, with and the it's, military it is, or look, you know, during during this point. time, I don't think it surprises anybody that during this time, civilian buildings uh, will be taken over by either side that were used at one point and as as military spaces. There we j- I just showed before you came on a uh, like a cement factory next to a quarry that the Russians have been using as a staging point, and they blew up two of the buildings on the Ukrainians fired and blew up two of the buildings and a bunch of trucks on that space because nobody's working at that cement factory. No one is making cement right now. That it, that place is basically just taken over, and and you can see it. You can see them watching with their drones for you know hours, if not days, ahead of time what the action is going on in that particular space to to recognize it. Is this something they're 
part and parcel to. They're like forcing people to work like they did in Chernobyl, where there's civilians there. And so therefore we can't hit it because the Russians are making them continue to do stuff. They're doing that with farmers, for example. And or is it just a space they've taken over? And in this case, it was just a space they've taken over. So they fired on it. No one watching drone footage of that mall would think for a second that it was anything other than a mall. There were no military vehicles around it. There were no military vehicles coming in and out of it. They, they didn't use a blown up part of the building to hide stuff from aerial reconnaissance. It was none of that stuff. It was a functioning mall with people in the parking lot going to and from it as you do. And even the most paranoid fantasy about Nazi shoppers that Russia might have still wouldn't excuse the, you know, an attack on a space like that. Yeah, there's also there's also another thing about the Ukrainians, and I don't want to put on rose-colored glasses, and I don't want to heighten my my affection, you know, let my affection for these people color my impression of what's happening here. Mm-hmm. But there's a couple of things about the Ukrainians. One, they're fighting the defense of war to protect their own people, and secondly, there is a sense within Ukraine of like we are fighting for our people, we are fighting for Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. And, and I am not going to say that it's an impossibility that they would hide themselves amongst the populace and that, you know, it, it, you hear it all the time that in, in you know, it, that, well, they were hiding amongst the people. They were using them as human shields. And so the fact that their civilians got hurt is really on them, not on us for having attacked it. Right. right. I'm not going to say that that is an impossibility at all. Mm-hmm. But I am going to say that that does not fit with the overwhelming attitude of the Ukrainians, which is protect our people at all costs. We are fighting a defensive war. We are fighting this war for our people. And that just doesn't gel with the idea of of let's hide amongst the people so that if they got hit, we can claim a war crime or something like that. Right. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it would be, it's unnecessary for one. It would be. It's not, it would be. It's, un, it's also unnecessary, but it yeah. also would be contrary to the general attitude, of, right, of the entire country as a whole. Right. Not to say that that isn't possible. If, if everything's possible in love and war, I will. Right. I will. I will admit. I will say. Okay, those are bad guys for having done that, but it, it doesn't fit with the relationship between the general public and the, and the armed forces of Ukraine. Right. Um, so I, I don't, I don't buy that Russian argument that they're hiding amongst. Now Donbass, Donbass is a different situation because mm-hmm. of the ongoing war that's been going on for you know eight years, and and there's a mix of people who have signed on to the uh, to the separatist movement, and, and right. you know that's a much murkier situation. Of course, but like in 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 Kharkiv or Kiev or. You know, look, in in the vast majority of the territory here, they're not going to hide amongst the people and let the people be human shields because it's contrary to their whole ethos. Right. You know, look, if I'm proven wrong, I'm proven wrong, and I'll admit it. But it just, having spoken to Ukrainians, having spoken to people in the armed forces, getting the general feel of 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 the war effort here, it would be very, con- it would very much be in contradiction. Yeah, it's absurd. To, to uh, here's the thing, I, like, like I said, there are certain areas where I think both sides are, uh, are. It's very possible that they might, you know, use those kind of infrastructure because that's the only standing building left in some places. That kind of stuff. This being so close to populated centers, which are not currently engaged in troops in contact moments, is is where it like. You know, they blew up that uh, repair shop because they were like, they've used this bus repair shop and they're repairing tanks with it. And therefore, okay, you can make an argument that they strategically did that about that space because it had the infrastructure in it to be a strategically important point. But, you know, I I disagree with it, but I can see where they could make that case. The truth is with this mall, though, again, aerial reconnaissance is around. There's a difference between hiding amongst the people for camouflage and using the populace as human shields. Yes. And I'm not crazy about the idea of hiding amongst, like, no. you know, hiding amongst the people so that you can refit and, and, and send your armor back out to the front lines. I, I, I disagree with that tactic, but right. I, I don't, 
I, the difference being, I don't see the cynical maliciousness of like, we're going to put our people between us and the Russians so that either one, we can do a, re, you know, we can do a false flag and we can incense our people. The mm-hmm. Ukrainians are already incensed. They don't have to be driven further to, to opposition against the Russians. Um, right. And, and, and secondly, um, it just doesn't it doesn't fit with the relationship between the right. armed forces and the people. And to put that at risk. You run the risk of losing public support for the armed forces, right? Uh, and it just—it wouldn't. Yeah, it strategically anyhow, makes can, no again, sense. But I it, can see—I right. can, I can see the idea of let's hide, let's hide a, a machine shop, or let's you know people who are, uh, you know, making camouflage or making uh, bulletproof vests or mm-hmm. who are making tank traps. In what used to be auto body shops, that's not you know, hiding though. That's, that's just repurposing. Happening. That's re- that's repurposing in a in a war using what you know factories you do have to make what you need for that fight. That's different than saying like we'll take a kindergarten and park a tank in it. You know, like in the yep. building to avoid detection by UAV. And that's the yep. that's the stark difference. And I it like. There, it's it's abundantly clear, especially with this mall, that there's none of that. It just yeah. isn't. Because oh, you can I'll see it from the thing. sky. Yeah, another thing I wanted to talk to you about is I caught your thing uh, where you were discussing something, oh, that, that British idiot was talking about. Uh, oh, and Russ- you talked about uh, Tybee. Yeah, and yeah Tybee Matt and Tybee. Ames. Right. Tybee and Ames. Okay, so the, they were they were you referenced a, a paper that they made in the late '90s right. called the Exile mm-hmm. in Moscow, and that's when I, that was my time in Moscow. I lived in Moscow. In the, I oh, read shit. the Exile almost almost every week. I read the Exile, hmm. and it was it was absolutely filled with the most misogynistic. Um, mm-hmm. Like they used to, they used to do club reviews, and right. they used to have like. You know how how easy it is to get underage girls drunk and take them home from this bar. Ha 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 ha. Jesus, sort of thing. Um, or um, I mean, they would constantly they would constantly talk. I, and it was, I admittedly, I don't know how much of this was dark sarcasm and kind of the furry freak mothers, kind of my seventeen year old, right? You know, girlfriend sort of thing, and how much of it was really their kind of rolling around Moscow with a blue passport and going, I own this place, which is what made, which is part of what made the Russians so angry at the carpetbaggers who flooded into, into Russia in the post 1991 world where a bunch of Westerners rocked up and threw around a bunch of dollars right. and, and thought they owned the place. That was kind of their attitude in the exile. Right. And Ames, both Ames and Tybee were, their paper was really pretty nasty um, in retrospect. And, um, and and it was it was complicit in that atmosphere in the 1990s. So Tybee would like to, I'm sure, sweep it under the rug. I've met Matt a few times. I, I knew his father. Um, right. I mean, you know, he's not half as smart as he thinks he is. Um, but and Ames was Ames was a drug addict. Uh, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. full full stop. And. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and and I you know look addiction is no joke it's a disease but you know I wouldn't I would not right I, I wouldn't raise him up as some either Tybee or Ames as some kind of great understand you know sage on on Russian uh, history or culture especially not during the 90s well but here, um, by the way here's this is uh it's Mark Ames right um. That's this is his, him, him on Twitter, Mark Ames exiled. And basically, here's him three hours ago shitting on the study of wars um, tweets about this, just the strategy that Ukraine is involved in. Essentially, them saying that the the pullback in Severodonetsk looks like a strategic withdrawal, which by everybody's measure who actually gives a shit, it looks exactly like that. You've got limited resources. How can you draw the enemy out in a certain area where you've got more control, blah, blah, blah. That, and then drawing in that, their attention away from Kherson specifically and that, you know, this yeah, other part. Well, you know, but, and also, also, these were the guys who were giving voice 
to a an extreme far right reactionary movement right. that that kind of resulted in um, Putin in, in that grew out of the disillusionment with the West in right. in uh, in post Soviet Russia. I mean, they gave they gave voice to a guy by the name of uh, Edward. Uh, I think it was Lomonosov, mm -hmm. um, who was a straight up fascist, absolute one hundred percent straight up fascist. They gave him a, a weekly op ed. Um, yeah. You know, it, it was the exile was we in my late 20s and early 30s. I, it was kind of like I was ha ha, you know, how silly. And also there was a dearth of decent English language papers. There was the right. Moscow Times there was exile and the Moscow Times was a very straight newspaper. It was just it was just about about, about you know, articles and, uh, you know, reprinting the wires and, and that kind of stuff. Very right. down the down the road, straight news sort of thing. Whereas the exile was kind of like, hey, this is the greatest new club, even though they did kind of like do this kind of ugly American thing. Right. So I yeah, I used to read the exile on a weekly basis. Right. Um, but looking back on it now, it it, it was it was a pretty disgusting rag mm -hmm. and um and fed into the fed into the culture that a lot of Westerners um Played, played up and part of the reason why Russians are so resentful of that era is, is right. that kind of attitude. So, you know, fuck Matt Taibbi and fuck Mark Ames. Yeah. I mean, both of them are gross. Um, and, and it's interesting how, you know, kind of like, you know, Cenk Uger's early uh, conservative stuff. It wasn't so much that they were just conservative back in the day or that they were bro-ish back in the day, but that it was kind of off the charts gross. There's a difference between like, you know, uh, like youthful, hubristic, uh, bro language where you're just kind of like, you're just surrounded by people. Yeah, that's how you talk. Yeah. And, and then but full on like hostile grotesque misogyny and yeah. and the and the active denigration of of women in particular i mean the 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 you know chenk's old well, they articles wanted, they wanted to be kind of they wanted to be hunter thompson kind of gonzo journalism and stuff but it, it was yeah but he wasn't not, that way they, they per se they weren't talented enough they weren't talented right. enough to be hunter thompson and they right. weren't and they were they weren't um they weren't as honest Right. As Hunter Thompson, they were, they were boys. Which is what makes it, with, which is what is required to write that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there, there's that. Um, and they, and, and it, and it also is interesting to see both Ames and Tybee taking the side of Putin <clears throat> and taking the side of Russia, you know, because like, oh, we spent so much time there. We under we get, the work, we get where they're coming from. Well, I get where they're coming from too. Right. I spent, uh, I spent, and they could stay there, if not the same amount of time in Russia as as Tybee and Ames, um, then darn well near. Uh, yeah. and I get where the Russians are coming from too, and I disagree. How about yeah. that? I think it's wrong what they're doing yeah. to this country, right? And I, I think that just because you, you know, you think you're the purveyor of what it is to be Slavic, that you get to dominate a neighbor, um. And, and that you know you can you can do things like Bucha and Mariupol and you know, right. Irpin and uh, Kharkiv and you know the list goes on and on. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And also, just generally, I mean, I've, again, I've been monitoring through uh, Julia Davis's stuff, um, what yeah. they're saying on Perry Canal, and it just continues to be disgusting. It's getting um, yeah, it's getting worse you know, by the week uh, in drastic it is getting, amounts. It is getting worse. Yeah, you're right. It is getting worse because I think they're starting to realize that they're going to lose. Yeah, and I, I think it's getting to the point where they're 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 desperate. I mean, the latest thing I saw on on the drive up here or during a pocket where I had um, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, where I had a signal, I watched one of the things today where some guy, um, I think he was a former Duma deputy, you know, yeah. saying we should absolutely flatten Ukraine. We should destroy all the tunnels into Romania in the Carpathians. We should um, knock down all their bridges. We should. And I yeah. was watching this and I was going, one, that's disgusting. I mean, it's I mean, it is it's it's it would be carpet bombing the entire country is basically yeah. what he was calling for. 
And two, you don't have the you don't have the capacity. You don't have the means. That's the one. That's right. the one. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. They this don't is have the, the means to do that. No, the idea is that well, they technically do if they well, nuke, if they nuke nukes. it out of existence. Right. That's what I mean. Like they they only have it in that. And so every talk of this, the cutting off electricity, blowing up all bridges and tunnels, destroying the economy of the Baltic countries, stopping all energy exports, with that means nuking the place. Just you know, turn it into a toxic wasteland of you know nuclear devastation. There, if you can't have her, you know, if I can't have her, no one will. The stalkers, you know, love song, and and the 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 concept is is that we'll just destroy everything. Now, this could should come as no surprise to anybody because, like I said, who here in the audience are anybody supporting Russia in this argument drives a Russian car? or has a wa- Russian washing machine, or has Russian computer chips in their computer, or, or uses a Russian phone, if you're not from there and currently there, quite frankly, any Russian who leaves the country can't wait to get their hands on the stuff that's made everywhere but Russia. So Russia is not in the creation business. You know, and they're not even in the case of, say, you know, like China is in the copy and replicate business. They're in the destruction business. Destroy everybody else's stuff and just having anything at all seems better by comparison. And that's how they, that's what their entire governmental structure is based on. Democracy sucks. Look how easy we wrecked it and how easy it is to be wrecked. The only thing that they do well is rip it out of the ground and sell it. Right. That's all they do. There is an intellectual property coming out. Anybody who is smart enough. To actually sell something, yeah. See, that's Kremlin Chuck. That's disgusting. Yeah. yeah. Then there you go. There's more. There's more of you know what their mo. That's, that's how what they, they're good that's at. That's how they conduct war. But anybody who is smart enough to actually develop a decent IP um, gets the hell out. Yep. Gets the hell out as quickly as they can. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I mean, the the amount of Russians or or you know, former Soviet Union nationals that are in Silicon Valley is uh, significant. Uh, you know, they get they get out because it's not it's it's not a good place to be. Actually, it's also not a good place to be wealthy. Right. Because eventually somebody is going to come knocking on your door and say, you know, you've now risen to a point where your head is above the parapet and you either play the ball with the rest of us or we're going to crush you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're wealthy, in Russia, you either play as part of the kleptocracy or you get out yeah. as quick as you can. And that's why a lot of that's a, why a, they send all their kids abroad to go to Oxford or the, you know, or the Sorbonne. Um, you know, they, they send them to New York. They send mm-hmm. them to Miami. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, because it's not if you're powerful in Russia, then you are part of a right. very dangerous game. Well, that was that that was part of what I brought up earlier and why, you know, one of the the facts that Russia's military was is sort of doomed to fail ultimately in in all their endeavors long term is because narcissism and and genuinely clever strategic thinking are mutually exclusive. We learned this with Trump on January 6th and we're learning this about uh, Vladimir Putin because you can't you have to question what might go wrong. You have to second guess come up with, you know, fallback plans, multiple tiered fallback plans, and especially in a war scenario like this one that's this complicated with this many moving parts. And he's broomed anybody who would even question that it was going to work, that Kiev wouldn't be taken in two days. And it was not where they were going to roll in. Like anybody who questioned that has been marginalized. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's too easy. It's too simplistic to say that they are incapable of like anticipating an enemy's action because they lack empathy because of this sense of narcissism and sense of like ego, you know, sense of I'm ego talking about because like you top, have to have top a down ego. strategy. Top down strategy it's, is it's, antithetical it's to it. Overwhelmingly yeah. simplistic to say this, but I, I'm, I am going to at least float this point and it's, it's way, way more sophisticated and way more complicated than, than what I'm about to say. But it is the fact that they they cannot anticipate what the enemy is going to do because that would then they would have to put themselves in the enemy's 
uh, shoes. You have to, right. you know, so there's all this talk of like, oh, the, the Russians are such great chess players and they're, oh, they're so, well, they're great at maneuver. They're great at, um, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're good at manipulation. So there is mm -hmm. a sense of, of cynical empathy there because you play on the baser instincts of your, of your objective, your, your target. Right. But understanding, you know, understanding the better of our natures and understanding the idea that I'm not going to screw over my country for money or for sex or for whatever power, right. um, that there are people of principle in the world. It's, it's not as easy for them to digest that. Well, and like again, I said, I think there's a dome, I think there's a dome, way but I, I, I think there's a dome of control and strategy they're capable of doing anything within these confines they can get. They can be very tricky and clever within that ground. But anything bigger than that where your ego and your identity is totally on the line in a big way where there's no way to cut and run and you're invested, that's where narcissism overwhelms that situation. It's why Trump could could be very clever in his manipulation of like the, the real estate courts in New York or tax law or those kind of things. And he could go to court and brashly show up and and if they ultimately made him, you know, pay a fine at some point, he could take a loan on something, pay it with that money and never pay the loan back because he had connections with it. OK, that's inside a dome of protection that you can learn to operate in. And and Putin, you could argue that he was similar kind of situation within yeah, the I mean, a lot of people, KGB and, RG, uh, and yeah, the GRU. A lot of people make it. Go ahead. Yeah, a lot of people make a big point out of uh, the fact that um, Putin is big on judo. And, and he is. He is big on judo. Right. But but that is there's a difference between using an enemy's strength against him and understanding the motivation of your enemy. They literally don't understand as, as much time as he spent in Germany, notably East Germany, but still Germany, um, as much time as a lot of uh, Russian spies and intelligence officers spend in the West. There's. They, they like to say that we'll never understand the Russian soul. And I have oftentimes retorted to my, my Russian friends who say that to me with, well, that may be true, but you will, no, you will never understand the motivation of somebody who believes in, in, in an idea such as liberal democracy. Right. Or in our case in, the, in America, the Constitution. The mm -hmm. idea that, 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 that as a society, it is better if we try and work together Mm -hmm. than uh, if we are only out, out for self-interest. Right. Um, and, and it's, look, again, I am speaking in very broad strokes, but sure. it is something that they believe. I mean, I've, I've run into it, and I've been studying the Russians for 25-plus <clears throat> years. And this, it's just, yeah. it's a very different, it's a very different perspective on power and on interpersonal relationships and and basically how human beings uh, should interact mm -hmm. um and that is not to say that there aren't very smart uh russians who who do kind of get it but they are in the minority or and they left. tend to be ostracized and they tend to leave you're right right oh and to that end here's uh andre gurilyov oh, this uh, guy yeah so this guy is one of the people who's been ratcheting up the the rhetoric like crazy like apparently the other folks on there weren't talking crazy enough so they dusted this fucker off and brought him in and he's in this segment and he's talking about how they said that uh the they said the this uh the war in ukraine would not happen that's crazy that it could not happen he talks about in this clip hunting down russians in other countries and killing them basically you know splaying novacek in their face or shooting them because they're traitors in other countries, even if they just go there to settle, it's one thing to like go, you know, find our Benedict Arnold who gave away, you know, if they had an, their own Edward Snowden, they would hunt him down and murder him if he was in another country yeah. specifically. Abramovich. That, right. Um, you know. Uh, Navalny, uh, like gathering these people it, up. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, he's talking yeah. about just people who left, just people who moved away, just people who. Uh, you know, don't want to be there when Russia does this or wants to get the stench of it off them or decides to emigrate someplace else. This guy. Chubayev would yeah. be another one. 
just um, thinks, uh, hunt them down the and kill them. Master, why am I gap? You know his name? Uh, Gar Gary Kasparov. You know. Yeah. yeah. No, they can't buy it. Yeah, he means kill those people. He means hunt them down and kill them. Oh, we froze. Uh, Phillips uh, been a little choppy, but there he is. You're back. It was. It's a little choppy, but that's. Hey, we're you're calling from Ukraine. This is a ma modern tech miracle, anyways. Um, but anyways, this guy also talks about how at some point they're going to attack. The plan is to attack um, NATO. If like that's just in the car. Give me a quick second. I'll see if I can get on a better. I might be on my phone as opposed to on my Wi-Fi. If you give me a quick moment, I'll switch over. Sure. Yeah, here, I'll uh, jump over here. It'll be just me on screen while you do it, and you're turning yep, sideways. Yeah, I am on my phone. Give me a quick moment. Okay. See if you can switch over to Wi-Fi without it kicking you off. It'd be nice if it had a better handoff technology. It will probably, you'll probably lose me for a second here. That's okay. That's okay. I'll bring you back in otherwise. Um, I still hear him. So, uh, there he is sideways now. He's tilted the world another way. Yep, sorry about that. That's okay. And by the way, the chat room has a couple of questions for you. Um, okay. Um, the uh, um, Funky Buddha says, Philip, any insight into the effectiveness and pervasiveness of the Russian disinfo campaign inside the U.S.? Social media, bots, direct influence with compromised citizens, media, etc. And they say thank you. I'm back. I should be back. Okay. Did, did you hear what I, the question Am I put back? forward? Yes, you are back. You are. Yes. Might take a second. He might, he might be on it. Oh, and he left and he's going to. Okay, he'll dial back in. I'll get that question back up to him. Oh, uh, there he is. Okay. Pop back in. And three, two, one. There he is. That should be, there, that should be better. Yeah, it is. Um, okay. So, I was so what asking, was the question? The question was, uh, Philip, any insight into the effectiveness and pervasiveness of the Russian disinfo campaign inside the U.S.? Social media, bots, direct influence with compromised Huge. citizens, media, et cetera. Yeah. Huge. Uh, it, 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 put, it put Trump in office in 2016. I mean, right. what, what better um, information uh, objective, you know, information warfare, uh, warfare, warfare objective could there be yeah. than putting that jackass Cheapest. in the press, in the Oval? Cheapest and, um, win ever. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it continues to be. Look, I will say this. I, I have said this many times. I will say it again many times. The Russians look at America in particular, the Anglo-American alliance in particular, but America in particular, as enemy number one. Um, and they study us more than they study any other country. Right. Because they see us as the primary, if not the sole enemy uh, of Russia, that, that, that for now, at least they can they can play nice with the Chinese. Maybe someday down the road, they're going to have to fight him again. But really, it's America that's the threat. Right. And, and that and that does come also from centuries of fighting with the British. You know, I mean, that goes back to the great game that goes back to the Crimean War. That goes back to a number of different things. They right. don't. They study us deeply and, 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 and just meticulously, and they know which levers to push mm -hmm. and which fault lines we have in our society. I, they will be all over the abortion. They will all, they will be, they already are. Yeah, they've they already all, announced this. They will be, yeah, they already announced it. They will be all over Roe v. Wade. They will be, they will be driving divisions between Americans not, not that that's hard to do, but they will just, they will look at that wound and they will pour as much salt on that wound as they possibly can because mm -hmm. their whole objective is to d drive divisions between us. And, and they know it. They will do it with race. They will do it with class. They will do it with regional differences. They will do it with religion. They will do it with anything that they can right. to exacerbate the difference because they want they want us, they recognize that the, the sloppiest thing in a democracy is, right. is that democracies are sloppy. Right. That, that the, most, the best weapon that they can use against the democracy is the democracy itself. Mm -hmm. uh, they do know that. They under, again, it goes back to this kind of, they understand their enemy in terms of using its own strength against it, but they don't understand 
that actually it is our it is our multi ethnic multi or our desire to build a multi ethnic multicultural society that is our strength one of our strengths. Mm -hmm. um, and so they will they'll attack everything. They'll be all over Roe v. Wade. They'll be all over any fault line that exists. Well, that, that's what and I was tomorrow. Right, right. If it's, tomorrow, if it's the Second Amendment again, they will come at that. If, Which is so know, ironic. The, that, the whole Maria Bertina story always shocks me as hilarious. And the manipulation and flying NRA guys over there, considering how draconian the rules about personal gun ownership is in Russia, that you have to have a, like a rifle license for 10 years or five years before you can even get a handgun. And then they count the ammo. And if you go out with 10 bullets and you come back with nine, you better have the shell casing or you're in big trouble. Like that kind of stuff. If the, we had rules that were even... 50% of what the rules are in Russia, the the NRA would be exploding right now. They would just, you know, even, and I, here's, I, I think I've been working on a couple of like messaging strategies. And I think one of the strategies that we should put forward is, is that since the, the right likes Russia so much, we should just adopt their gun laws. Just put it out <laughs> and don't even say what they are. Let let the right go hunt them down. Go learn what they are. Because I don't think a lot of them know, or at least they pretend not to know. This is an article in the Daily Beast Julia Davis put out. Putin's crew is already scheming to exploit America's abortion chaos. Um, uh, this is like, uh, let's see, criminal propaganda, the ruling Charlie divide American society, bonus for Russia at a time when distraction is, uh, is important. What's happening in America right now is very interesting, said Vladimir Solovyov during Monday's broadcast of a show, The Evening with Vladimir Solovyov on uh, Rosia One, discussing the Supreme Court's ruling. The host snipe America has proclaimed that it is winning, that its liberal values have triumphed, but suddenly, here's this law that prohibits abortions. Well, we have accused pro-choice activists of Satanism and mimicked their cries, distorting his voice and his facial expression, uh, yelling out, my choice, the contradiction of mocking both the law and those who oppose it is perfectly reasonable in Moscow, where Western divisions are highly valued and, uh, and America as a whole is loathed in pro-Kremlin circles. Um, this is, and they, and here's the thing. I think this is the most important part of this argument. And it comes up a bunch. N they don't really care about the issue itself. No. They don't care about, no. uh, BLM or they don't care about police violence or they don't care about guns on the streets in America or they don't care about crime or drugs or any of the issues that any major society happens. They don't care the, about international law. Right. And so they can exploit either side of the message because what they do care about is is wrecking people's feelings about their own country and undermining your feelings about democracy long term so that you eventually just go, look, I don't like his kind of authoritarianism, but I wouldn't be against there being a version of authoritarianism with my folks in charge. Right. And lean yeah. people in that direction. So when they scream, sympathetic. when they jump up and down and scream about international law. They're, it's, they're being completely disingenuous because they break it themselves all the time. And they also don't, look, they don't believe in the idea of the rule of law full stop. Right. If you get, so all these people who are screaming, who get on their left and right, and actually in a lot of ways, the left jumps on this a lot more than the right does because the right is equally like, I don't care about law, I care about right. power. But the left jumps on this thing about, well, the, the, you know, look, look at what happened in Iraq. Look at what happened in Vietnam. Look at how many times we break our own pre our own ideals of, of the rule of law on the international stage. Right. <clears throat> and you know what? Yeah, we do. And we should be ashamed and we should be upset and we should try and change it. And we should mm -hmm. do everything we can to change it. But. They don't care about it, really. They use it as a weapon against us because we know that we will look at it and go, you know what, that isn't right, and I don't feel good about that, and I am right. upset with the with the, what the what the, what is being done in my name. But they don't intrinsically believe it in themselves. Right. They're only using it as a weapon against us. And 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 there's a number of, of things that I can point to to back that up, that back that thesis up. And but the most important one is. They don't believe in the whole concept of the rule of law, full stop. Yeah. All these people who think that, oh, Russia is standing up for the international community and for international law, go to Russia. Seriously, I'm not saying go to Russia and like, if you don't like it, go to Russia. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, literally go to Russia. Go for a month. Go mm -hmm. for a month. Go, not right go, now. Go sit in. But, 
Yeah. Go sit in at a court case. Go sit, preferably go sit in at a court case in a place like Ekaterinburg or, or Irkutsk. Mm -hmm. You will see that the court system in Russia is only a device to be used by the powerful to subjugate the weak. And and they and that and and that it's expected they, that that's accepted. That is yeah. that is that is the way the game is played. Whereas we get upset when there is a, when there is an abuse of, 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 of law, when there is an injustice, we say, uh, you know, we, we, we get upset about it. Mm -hmm. Russians, if you if you go to a Russian and you say that person is going to take that other person to court, one of the first thing they'll say is who's on who's on the defendant's side and who's on the plaintiff's side. Who are who are the who are the backers of that court case? Who's got the bigger? You right. know, who's got the lawyer? Who's got the and, and look, I know there are going to be people who say, well, how, how is it different in America? Well, it is different in America because sometimes the little guy does win. And that's when it, that's when the system works. Right. And, 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 and also we get upset when the system doesn't work. It's an injustice. What the point I'm trying to make is for a Russian, that's just the way it goes. That's just right. I mean, it's, it, the court system is not about the rule of law. That's why the court system is so it's so Byzantine. It is so convoluted. And there are so many laws in Russia and many of them contradict one another. And that's done on purpose. Right. So, that, so, you, so that you can, if you're you powerful can't lose. enough, you're right. You can't lose. You can right. always point to one law or another. And the fact that they're contradictory laws and the, 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 there are layers of laws and laws that contradict one another. And you can always find some law book from this place or that place, some statute here, some statute there, that you can use to pummel your opponent. If the judge is on your side, if the powerful are on your side, you're going to win. It's not it's not the rule of law. It is it's about power and their entire legal system, which is one of the reasons, by the way, to bring it back to Ukraine. Why one of the fundamental? So we talk about the causes of this war. And one of the fundamental things that we talk about in this war is the fact that the that the Ukrainians were cozying up to the West. They want to be yes. Europeans. They don't have the they don't have the schizophrenia of the Russians. But another major, and I mean major, point of the war that started in 2014, what spurred the Maidan, and subsequently has delivered us to where we are here, was because Ukrainians were like, hey. This is not a system of law. This is not the court system only benefits the powerful. We don't we don't want that. We want yeah. a proper court system. You know, and and that was a major motivator for for Maidan and the subsequent uh, uh, you know revolutions that are happening here and the resistance to falling under Moscow's thumb. It's yes, it's sovereignty. Yes, it's in, it's uh, self determination. Yes, it's leaning more towards a liberal democracy and a, and a Western European model. But a huge part of it is corruption. And a huge part of that is the fact that the court system and the justice system is deeply flawed here. And they're working on it. They're trying to, they're trying to reform it. They really are. But it is a very difficult thing to do when you are climbing yourself yeah. out of that James, kind of business. James, the, James bringing up uh, like style. Ghislaine Maxwell, for example, in this, as connected as Epstein was to people that he was pow that are powerful, both people that I think he more than likely blackmailed, people that he hung around just because if he got a picture with them, it would keep him in a protected class, and certainly did in Florida over a time. Ultimately, he you know he was not able to be, and neither is she, able to be protected by just the fact that she knows these people that she was on a boat with George H. W. Bush at some point or whatever. It doesn't matter. So, like, that's the huge difference between Russia and the States, period, end of story. Um, and we, uh, I, there was another question that came up uh, asking about how Malcolm is. He was on Stephanie Miller's show this morning, and he's going to be back on the 10th of July in stateside temporarily. Yeah. So. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's putting out his new book. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, he has, uh, he has obligations to his publisher, yeah, uh, and he has other obligations. Uh, so yes, I, if he has made that public already, then yeah, yeah. he's going to be back in the states for a while. Right. I, I am I am in uh, occasional contact with him, but my again, 
my, I mean, I know people are concerned about him and I know people are asking about him and I will answer the same way that I always right. answer. And I'm not going to go any further unless he already announces it. Right. I will not talk about Malcolm Nance aside from the point, aside from saying I am in touch with him and he is either fine or he is, you know, whatever. He, I, I, I do not think even if he was in a hairy situation, it's not behold. It's not my, that's not my place. Mm-hmm. It's not my place to talk about, it, you know, even if he was in the middle of a really sticky, you know, fighting situation, I don't think I would convey that information because that's not for me to say. So right. I respect that people are asking about how he's doing, but short of saying that I'm in contact with him and that right. he, is, he is fighting a war, he is fighting right. a war. And I will say, I will say, I will not lie and say he's fine when I know he's not fine. But I, but I will. That's as far as I'm going to go. And yeah. you guys can keep asking me about it, but I'm just you got to understand just this is in. a war. Yeah, well, I and think I, all they want to know. And I know uh, it comes from. Yeah. I know it comes from a good place. I know yeah. it does. But you have to understand the man is fighting a war. Yeah. And for me to say anything more than what I am allowing myself to Even, say, yeah. despite what I know, might actually put him in harm's way, and I am not going to live with that. If I if I am to say something. Right. And somebody picks it up and he gets harmed because of what I say. Yeah, because even saying that's not where, okay with me. Wh- like I ran into him or I spoke with him means that they can know where he is in you exactly. know, in terms it of the country. As, it could be as innocuous as that. It could, I right. had dinner with him last. You know, I had dinner with him last night means that he's in Kiev. Right. Or right. In, oh, no, Odessa, you know, or whatever, it, you know, if I'm out in Lviv and I say I had dinner with Malcolm last night, well, then people know he's in Lviv. Right. So it doesn't, I, I just have a very strong rule. Yeah. And it's not just Malcolm. I would do this with other correspondents. I would do this with, I would do this any, with anybody who is a war fighter or who is putting themselves in harm's way Yeah. because it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. War, war is not something to be flippant about. War is yeah. not something to be casual about. So, yeah. I, I respect that it's coming from a place of concern and care, but my, I will just repeat once and again, once, and you know, I will keep saying this. The, the only thing I will say about Malcolm is he's that fine. he is, he's fine. Yeah. He's fine. Great. And he's fighting a war. That's right. Um, awesome. And, um, and by the way, we've got, uh, just a couple minutes left and then you can go eat the dinner that you had to go get before, uh, huh. the I'll show started. In the nuker. It's fine. Yeah, it's good. Um, and, this, you know, let's see, I think I pulled up another question. Um, oh, somebody did bring up, by the way, that Russia did, cr- in my rant about them not creating anything, they did make Tetris. So I, I would like to say, for the record, that... Uh, gotta, yeah, hey, look, their space program. Yeah. They're the first guys who put somebody in space, but that was a long they, time ago. And they weren't worried about and, getting uh, them back. <laughs> that, that's yeah. that's what slowed us down. Honest to God, it's one of the things that slows down the U.S. space program more than anything else. And it, and it, we went further even than the rest of the world did was that we would like to get our astronauts back. Thank you very much. Whereas Russia was like, well, you know, it's a tin can. I don't know what to tell you, bro. Um, fortune favors the bold. Good luck. See you later. Um, yes. Yeah. What's their reaction? Their reaction to show noble. Just go in there and start throwing, you know, throw, start throwing dirt on stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so uh, I don't know. Do you? Are you planning on what's your you know, we can talk about where you are. To, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stick around in Kiev. Okay. Um, I might do a quick jaunt out to Lviv. Uh, I have to be stateside. Uh, in I most likely have to be stateside in August mm-hmm. um, for a couple of uh, some personal, some professional reasons. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I spent a little too much money in Odessa, so I'm going to have to kind of hunker down in camp sure. for a little while. But I might that might change. That might change if I if I get an influx. Of, I'm working on getting an influx of cash, and if yeah. I do get an influx of cash, I might I might head to another city. But um, for right now, uh, for the immediate term, through most of early to mid July, my intention is to basically be here in Kiev. Great. Great. Okay. Well, we'll uh, like, and Saturday we'll uh, touch base on more of these things and I'll let you go so you can enjoy your evening. And, uh, and then I will see everybody this afternoon for my three o'clock show. Yeah. 
Um, and thanks and, for- you know, I might also I might also look into the possibility of doing a live stream. It's not something I've done in the past, but if Let I mean, maybe a moderator or something. Oh, dude. Well, we could totally make that happen. You, you let yeah. me if you need and that any with my door. If anybody heard that on the mic, yes, that was just the wind blowing my door closed. OK, good. All right. We, we, every noise <laughs> makes us jumpy these days about your personal health. Yeah. Uh, we love you, Philip. Yeah, well, we're glad I mean, they're not joking around. Yeah. They're we're, not joking around. No, we're uh, we're glad you're well. And I look forward to talking to you on Thank Saturday, you. as does everybody else. And they'll prep their questions and we'll have our happy ending for you. And I would like, love that. I until, would love that. And until, thank you, everybody. for your. For, thank you, everybody, for continuing to follow me on various uh, uh, platforms share, and uh, yeah. spread the word and all that good stuff. Absolutely. And I, I recommend uh, everybody follow so that he can live stream on on YouTube as quickly as possible. That helps immensely. And uh, and anything I can do tech wise to make that a little easier on you, you let me know and I'll fill you in because I've, well, I've got I've, one. I've got one that I've been working on. Uh, I got two reports out of Odessa that I'm going to uh, pick up a couple of elements here and then right. I'll publish them. I've been I've been uh, I've been slightly distracted with some stuff that I don't want to go into because it's personal. Um, but, uh, I haven't posted in far too long, so I'm going to try and get out, uh, the first thing I'm going to, with one of the blogs that I hope to get out in the next day or so, is just an assessment of the kind of strategic importance of Odessa and why it is Odessa Excellent. is kind of this, this, yeah. this defensive, but also offensive, um, um, kind of, uh, fortress right. in Southern Ukraine. Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, I look forward to it. I will share your uh, YouTube page again to everybody on my Twitter feed as well. And when you guys are watching, if you want to feed it out to the rest, uh, then please yes, do. Please. Yep. So uh, thanks, Philip. And I'll let you go and I will All see right, you guys. later. All sorry, right. I, sorry, I got here as quick as I could. Sorry, we only great. had about an hour instead of, totally instead cool. of last week's two. We'll try we'll, and do it next week, but I'll we see will. you on Saturday. We absolutely will. All okay. Right. Cheers. Slava Ukraine. Okay. Slava Ukraine. There you go. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the great. Philip Inner joining us live from Ukraine. It's nice to have a correspondent of my very own in, in Ukraine. I have to say, I'm uh, attempting to share him with as many people as possible and get, you know, Steph and other people to bring him on uh, as part of their lineup as well. So if you guys enjoy when I have him on on Wednesdays or whatever, if you want to share um, these posts to people that you think should have him on as well, you know, that I might not think of, you know, Feel free to do that. Also, uh, I really appreciate um, that we had a couple of pro-Russian trolls in here today. I didn't draw attention to some of the stuff they were saying just because I know it. Like Phil gets set off about it. I, you know, we in our chat room, we we roll with that shit a little bit uh, easier. But it's nice to watch it, you know, play out and watch you guys go eh, whatever. Um, that's that's one of the roughest things I think for the uh, the Russian bots and trolls that get into our chat room in particular is just it's it's like watching them slow up uh, show up to a bat at a stadium and just swing nobody's pitching at them nobody's doing anything they're just kind of running around waving a bat in the air like all right he he looks like he's having a good time (laughs) um but they help us in the algorithm and they boost us even when they don't want to and uh and there you go and it's you know it's good occasionally that you can sort of you can sort of it's a, it's a way of plumbing the moral depths or lack thereof of uh of that side of the argument because if you sometimes if you jump on a troll right away and people react to them then that talking point gets you know wound up and became and it becomes a thing if you just kind of let them go sometimes they will themselves unprompted tell you basically that they don't give a shit about anyone in the world and that they are pro death or whatever. Like it, it happens. Like if, if you don't, sometimes that's one of the best things you can do just in general, when you see sort of trolling behavior on Twitter, I mean, the trolls aren't what they used to be. I mean, in, in 2016, they actually had impact. Um, now they're just adorable, but if sometimes you'll see it play out and you'll see people kind of take the bait and get into this cyclical fight about certain stuff. And then you're like, Oh, I, I'm arguing with someone who a might not even be real and B might de- definitely doesn't give a shit. Um, and, uh, <laughs> n- n- no more war. Okay, good. Well then stop Russia from declaring war on people and let me know how that works out. The defensive side, it's not the responsibility of the defensive side 
to stop the war ever, not ever. But good luck with that. It doesn't point out the fact that you just don't care who gets killed and raped. Good on you. Um, that said, I'm just kind of poking now at this point. Is it, is it this called reverse trolling? Is that how it works? Um, anyways, I will see you guys later on for the afternoon show. Take care of yourself and take care of somebody else. Um, I, I appreciate you, not only you guys being here, but being able to like introduce you guys. There's my end screen. I have it somewhere. Um, being able to introduce you guys to Philip and what he's doing. I will tweet out his channel later on. Okay. Take care of yourself. Take care of somebody.